to Career Fair Prep for International Students. Um, we have some good information for you today about how to prepare for the upcoming career fairs, some different strategies and tools to use for that, as well as a lot of good information um, about work authorization and other topics of that nature. Um, so to get started, I'll introduce myself. My name is Molly Green. I use she, her, hers pronouns, um, and I'm the Career Education Coordinator in SuccessWorks. And I'll pass it over to Kathleen. Hi, all. Good morning for you who are in Wisconsin. My name is Kathleen Finnegan. I use the pronoun she, her, and hers, and I am the Programming Coordinator with International Student Services. Amy, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Kathleen. I'm happy to be here. My name is Amy Minot, and I use she, her, and hers pronouns. I'm an ISS advisor, so if you have questions later up and want to pop in to talk to an advisor, it might be me. Happy to be here. Thank you. All right, so just to quickly go over the agenda, the first part of this presentation, we will focus on the career fair preparation, info from SuccessWorks, and then the second half of the presentation, Kathleen will dive deeper into F1 and G1 employment options. Um, so for the beginning of this presentation, if you have any questions related to um, career fair prep or success works, that would be a good time to put those in the chat. And then maybe the second half, if you have questions more related to F1 or G1, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, but I'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, so we won't have any microphones on today. Feel free to put your cameras on. We would love to see your faces um, if you'd like. But if you have any questions, please just put those in the chat and we'll be working on answering those um, as we move through the presentation. And if there's time at the end, we will do Q&A. So um, we also have a handout. I will post that in the chat. You can follow along with this. Um, we have quite a few links and resources included in here um, that are applicable to both parts of the presentation. Um, so feel free to take a look at that. Um, and I'm sure there are some pieces in there that you'll find helpful. So to get started, I want to ask all of you, why may it be important to attend a career fair? Um, or what are you hoping to gain by attending the career fairs next week? So if you want to put some ideas in the chat, um, I'd love to kind of review those and hear some of your thoughts about why, why do we attend career fairs? Good platform to know about potential employers, definitely. Introduce yourself to recruiters, for sure. Yes, it is a great hands-on experience to learn more about your future career. It's uh, a very good way to explore different career options, get your questions answered about specific career paths or companies or organizations, to get your name out there to recruiters instead of just applying online, for sure. It's always good to put a face to the name and establish that connection. These are all fantastic. Practice your elevator pitch. Yes, I love that answer. We will talk a lot about that too. Great, these are all really, really good answers. Um, Awesome. So I'm going to move forward, but if you have any other thoughts, please feel free to put those in there. So the main purpose of attending a career fair is to really network, and that encompasses a lot of things. Like some of you said, putting a face to the name, being able to interact with recruiters and, um, you know, leave an impression or at least establish that connection and learn about career paths learn about potential employers and get that hands-on experience navigating the career fairs in a way that's beneficial to your career path. And kind of all of that fits into networking. So networking is essentially establishing professional connections. And most often those connections are going to be beneficial to your career path, whether it's just to learn more information or to find a mentorship or some kind of mutually beneficial relationship. 
Um, it's a great way to get career information and advice, whether you're talking to or networking with classmates who are in the same major or same kind of career interests or alumni who have an interesting career path. Um, or, of course, talking with employers and getting advice from them directly. Another really good reason to network is because about 75% of jobs are not actually advertised. So the jobs that you see posted online on LinkedIn, on Handshake, that's only a small portion of the actual jobs that are available. Because more often than not, if an employer has a position that they need to fill, they're going to think, who do I know? Who may fit this position very well and sometimes reach out to that person before they ever publish the job online. So that's why it is really good to make that connection with recruiters and with employers so that you may be top of mind when they're hiring for internships or for other positions. And of course, you can always establish those connections and establish those relationships to be kind of mutually beneficial. Like you can help someone, they can help you, and the cycle just kind of keeps going. So networking is a really key piece of the career journey. And by going to the career fairs, you're all you know, really starting off on a good foot there. So just talking about how to prepare for the fairs, right? That's kind of what we're here to learn more about. Um, my advice would be to really do your homework about the employers who are attending the career fairs. So first you're gonna to wanna to register on Handshake you will have to register for each individual day of the fair. So the first day is going to be virtual um, on next Tuesday. And the second two days are actually going to be in person in the Gordon Dining and Events Center. Um, so depending on what day you wanna go, you'll need to register for those days and then see which employers are going to be there. Um, my recommendation, if it's your first time at the career fair or even if you're a senior kind of actually looking for jobs at this point, Choose a couple of employers to focus on when you get there, kind of take a lap and figure out where they are. Um, but coming prepared in mind, knowing who you want to talk to can help you feel more confident and more prepared when you're going into it. So think of who you want to talk to and write down a couple of questions that you want to ask them, either things that you're curious about their organization or um, just so that you definitely have some questions in mind. Um, I recommend writing that down on a piece of paper and bringing it with you. And then second, you'll want to prepare your materials. So be sure to update your resume and upload it to your Handshake profile. Um, if you don't have a Handshake profile, definitely, definitely get that set up. Um, if you are going to the virtual career fair, be sure to kind of go in and test your technology beforehand. Make sure your internet's working well, your camera's working well, um, and make sure you're able to register for sessions in that way. You'll also want to maybe lay out your clothes the night before, choose some appropriate attire, um, usually business casual or business professional, like some nicer pants and a jacket or a nice shirt um, is perfectly appropriate. But we also understand that you all are students um, and might not have built up that professional wardrobe yet. We do have the career closet at SuccessWorks if you are um, if you have financial need and you need to get a hold of some professional attire, um, that's an option for you. And then last, before you go to the career fairs, I think most importantly is practice your elevator pitch or prepare what you're going to talk about with employers, how you're going to introduce yourself. So we break down the elevator pitch into three main parts, and those are the ones that are colored at the top, so the green, yellow, and blue. So the present kind of talking about the essentials of who you are, your year in school, your major, um, any of that key information that tells them right away who you are. Then you wanna talk a little bit about your past or your background information. So if you have any previous work experience, but they're volunteer, internship, um, even involvement on campus, maybe talk about your coursework and how that's kind of informing your career decisions. Um, or any other relevant interests that you have. So usually choosing two to three of these pieces that really fit into your career narrative um, is a good way to go. And then talking about your future or your goals or objectives. And this is the part that I think students are most often forgetting to include in your elevator pitch. And this is the part that you can also kind of tailor a bit depending on who you're talking to. But talking about your goals or your future objectives um, is, like what you hope to do in the near or far future. 
Um, so maybe that's my, my goal is to get an internship in this field, um, or I eventually want to pursue graduate school in my, in my area of interest. Really depends what your future goals or objectives are. But if you're going to the career fair seeking an internship in your field, that's what you can say. And then you can also talk a little bit about um, why you're interested in a specific company or organization or field and explain a little bit in your elevator pitch, like why this company? If you go to the career fair and you really wanna to talk to Epic, tell them a little bit about why you've come to their booth. How are you a good fit for them? Or why is this role a good fit for you? Um, and then if you have any questions, you can kind of throw those in at the end too, to turn the conversation over to them and keep it flowing. Um, so this is who I am. This is what I'm about. This is why I'm interested in your company. What about you? What's your background? Um, and bring in different questions that way. So here's an example, just to quickly break down some of those different parts. So we'll start with the present. My name is Molly. I'm in my third year at UW-Madison, where I'm studying data science because I'm fascinated by how we can use data to inform real world decisions. And then a little bit about the past. I've learned a lot from my coursework and my previous volunteer experience doing data analysis for a nonprofit and then our future goals or objectives. I'm seeking to further develop my skills as a data analyst intern and pursue a career in data science. And then just to tailor it, I'm interested in learning more about your company because, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But here's a good format to use if you're just starting off working on your elevator pitch. And ideally this can be, you know, if it's a quick introduction, like 10 to 15 seconds, if it's a bit longer and you have more one-on-one -on -one time with the person you're speaking with, um, maybe 30 to 90 seconds landing somewhere in that range is an appropriate amount of time. So how should you navigate the fairs or what should you keep in mind during the fairs? Um, so first of all, you wanna make sure when you're speaking to someone to introduce yourself, again, use that elevator pitch to establish the connection with the person that you're speaking to. And the reason that you wanna do a little research beforehand about the employers is because those conversations are gonna be more worthwhile to you if you have some background information, if you can carry on a conversation about this company or organization or maybe the industry as a whole with the person you're talking to, you're going to be even more memorable and you're going to establish a stronger connection in that way. And if you have questions or you have things that you definitely wanna talk about for you know, your career exploration purposes, this is a really good time or it's a really good um, way to do that as well. Uh, I also really want to mention, it's important to show your enthusiasm, especially if this is a company you're excited about. Let that come through either by, you know, showing your emotions, smiling, being excited, nodding, kind of using your body language to show that enthusiasm for the organ company or organization that you're talking to. Um, and then asking thoughtful questions. I'll provide a few examples of some different questions you can ask, but these will really depend on the research you do about the company or organization and the genuine curiosity that you already have. Really key here, um, if you have a good conversation with someone or you meet with a company that you really want to continue that conversation with, be sure to ask for a business card, an email address, um, or some other means to contact the recruiters that you're speaking with. Um, you can write that information down. You can take their business card and write yourself a note to be sure to get in contact with them. And then also feel free to take notes if you wanna bring a notepad with you um, to either take notes on what you talked about with the person um, or any insights you gained into the positions that they're hiring for or the company itself. Certainly feel free to take those notes that you can remember it for later. So I talked a lot about asking good questions and keeping up that conversation. Um, so a couple questions to avoid during the career fairs or are just kind of going up cold to a booth and asking the recruiter, do you have any job or internship openings? Because um, hopefully you would have done that research in advance uh, or asking like, what does your company do? Um, just also kind of shows you haven't looked into them beforehand. Um, so it's a good idea going into this to know to know what they do, maybe have an idea of what kind of openings they have available um, so that you can make sure to talk about how you're a good fit. 
And then asking, do you sponsor, um, isn't a great way to open up that conversation either, but we will talk about some ways to answer the question of um, when they ask, do you require sponsorship? So instead of these questions, some good things to ask are um, questions about the positions, questions about the company or organization that kind of show you've done some research or questions about the recruiter's career path as well. Um, so things like, what do you look for in candidates? What's a typical career path for someone at this company? Or how do people move through the ranks here? What's a day in the life like at this company? Um, what, do you, what do you like or dislike most about it? What advice would you give someone who's looking to intern here or who, for someone who has interned here? Um, what kind of next steps do they take? So there's all kinds of good questions that you can ask recruiters um, to really continue that conversation and leave a good impression, but also get a lot of good information for yourself moving forward in your career journey. So how do we answer that question? So let's say that you get an internship offer or you have a really good conversation with a recruiter. How do you answer the question if they ask, do you need sponsorship or do you need work authorization? Um, so short answer is my education visa covers me for internships. I don't need any authorization or sponsorship from an employer. Um, but we know that that can get a little bit more complicated um, down the road. So here are some good examples or some good ways to answer that question. Um, first one, my education visa covers me for X months during which time I do not need authorization or sponsorship from my, from my employer. But after that, I would need my employer to file for a work visa, but I expect by that time to have really demonstrated my value and my fit for your company. So going into it confident and knowing that you, you have value and you have the skills and traits that they're looking for in an employee and you feel confident that you know, after that period of time that you're on OPT, they'll want to keep you. Um, another example, I would not require sponsorship or any additional paperwork or expense to work for you as an intern. If, as I hope happens, I do such a great job that you want to keep me on for full time, then I would ultimately need sponsorship. So we know it's not necessarily a yes or no answer, but hopefully some of these ideas will help you word that and articulate that in conversations with employers. And finally, after the fair, you'll want to do some follow up. So if you do have some good conversations with recruiters, definitely, definitely be sure to send them an email within 24 to 48 hours to thank them for their time. Kind of remind them who you are. If there were any good topics of conversation that you had or there were any pieces of advice that they left you with that you really appreciated. Let them know that in an email um, to really help them draw that connection between, oh, I remember talking to this person at the career fair. Oh, they're sending me this email now, kind of reminding me about the conversation. You're gonna be even more memorable to them. And, um, and hopefully that helps when it comes time to applying for those jobs or internships. So this is also a really good reason why you want to get contact information, why you want to take good notes about your conversations that you have at the career fair. Um, if necessary, we can help you find that employer information at SuccessWorks. If you didn't happen to um, grab a business card or get that info while you were there, hopefully we can um, kind of put some of those pieces together. But overall, definitely just be mindful of getting people's contact information and continuing the conversation. You can also kind of make a plan to stay connected and say, maybe you're not quite ready for internships yet, but you just wanted to go to the career fair to establish some connections, to learn a bit about different career paths. In your email, you can say, would it be okay if I follow up in six months to keep you updated on, um, on my career journey and maybe we can get coffee or sometime, coffee sometime to chat? Um, Make a plan and how do you want to move forward with these conversations that you had, um, if at all. So additionally, after this, um, if you are applying for jobs and internships, you'll want to get yourself ready for possible interviews that may come up. Um, and some good ways to do that are to make an appointment with your career services office. Um, do some mock interviewing, talk through different interview questions and scenarios. Um, or review some of our online materials we have in SuccessWorks or in your career office. Um, those are all going to be great next steps to take. And finally, like I said, career advising. We have 15-minute same-day advising in SuccessWorks. 
Um, if you're not an LNS student, of course, you'll want to meet with your home career services office in your school or college. Um, so definitely make an appointment with a career advisor. I also want to mention um, this is a career prep career fair prep events, of course, but we also have career fair prep night for the broader campus population on Monday, this upcoming Monday from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. in Gordon Dining and Event Center. So if you feel like you want a little bit more preparation, you still have that opportunity on Monday before the career fairs on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Finally, we have a lot of events and success works and across campus coming up that are career related, um, a lot more exploration related. So definitely check those out. And then again, I did send you that handout in the beginning here. So take a look through that and see if there is any other helpful information um, for your preparation, for taking some of the next steps in your career journey, whatever it may be. And I think I will hand it off to Kathleen. Thanks, Molly. Wonderful. Yeah, so now that Molly has talked about preparing and really being successful at a career fair, I'm going to take a moment and explore more of the information about, you know, positions and working off campus related to your visa status. So as a reminder for folks who maybe haven't interacted with International Student Services much, we really are your home away from home. So we provide comprehensive immigration advice on F1 and J visas, J student visas. We support you when you encounter immigration, social, personal, and academic issues. We promote virtual and in-person co-curricular events and programs like this Global Badger Success Fridays we are doing. And ISS advocates for international students' needs and interests across campus. So we do like to learn from you all what you're wanting and then push campus and let them know how best we all can support international students. Okay, next slide. Wonderful. So today, just because of the limits of time, I'm gonna focus predominantly on F1 employment options. I'll touch briefly on J1 employment options, but if you do have questions, I highly encourage you to make an appointment with your assigned ISS advisor or join ISS for virtual drop-in advising, which we hold Monday through Friday every week. So some options for F1 employment. You can do on-campus work, you can do curricular practical training, or you can do optional practical training. And optional practical training breaks down into three choices. Pre-completion, before graduation, post-completion or after graduation, and a STEM extension for those who are in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields. Okay. So some notes about off-campus employment eligibility. First, you must be lawful F1 status, right? So that means you have an active I-20, you have been maintaining your status by enrolling full time for all of your fall and spring semesters and your first semester on campus. Um, you're reporting to ISS when you change addresses. You also have to be enrolled full time for at least one academic year. That's one fall and one spring semester. That's also while on active F1 status. So unfortunately, any semesters you are maybe all online taking classes from outside of the US without an active visa or without an active I-20 do not count towards that academic year requirement. You also have to have declared a major. To work off campus, your work relates to your major, which is why you have to have one declared. Um, so next slide. Wonderful. So just a note about remote work, because I know that could still be some of those positions that you're looking at when you go on Handshake and see some of those internships available. So for F and J students with on-campus employment, each department kind of has different rules set up for what works for remote work and what positions maybe wouldn't be as successful. So highly recommend you contact your department's human resources. For CPT, curricular practical training, which is with F, remote work is allowed, but if you're doing remote work, you need to tell ISS 
so we can make a note that the position you're doing while on CPT is remote. For optional practical training, remote is also allowed, and students do not need to inform ISS. On OPT, you report your employer's location, like the physical office location, and even if you're working remote, that physical office location does not change. All right, so let's dive a little bit deeper into on-campus employment. All right, so some requirements and things to keep in mind. During the fall and the spring semester, right, when classes are in session, only 20 hours per week is allowed all positions combined on campus. So it's possible to work like two jobs. You just want to make sure one job you're working there for four hours and your other job you're working there for 13 hours. During authorized vacation periods, so think spring break, summer break, and winter break, you can work over 20 hours per week. And in fact, immigration requirements uh, don't have a cap imposed for working on campus over break periods, but talk to your human resources because UW-Madison may limit to no more than 29 hours per week. You also have to have been enrolled full-time before the vacation period. So if you are working spring semester, um, you would want, and you want to work winter break, you also need to make sure that you were enrolled in classes for fall semester, right, before that vacation period. And of course, intend to enroll full-time after vacation period. So if you're graduating in May, you can't work over full-time vacation period of summer because, of course, you're not intending to enroll for fall semester. Lots more details on the Student Job Center website about what jobs are available. Grad Connections Weekly is a wonderful thing. Department websites also post, and ISS on social media frequently post on campus positions that we learn about. All right, so a couple notes about F1 on-campus employment eligibility. So on-campus employment is a benefit for all F1 students who are maintaining their F1 visa status. On-campus jobs include working on campus, right? So student unions, libraries, rec centers, and academic and administrative departments. UW-Madison, you all probably know by now, is quite large. And so if you're not sure what counts as on campus, what counts as off campus, I highly recommend you check out the ISS website. We have a whole page dedicated to it. As a full-time student, F1, you do not need special permission from ISS to work on campus up to 20 hours a week. You can just apply for jobs and congratulations if you get one. You will, however, need to request a social security letter from ISS to apply to get that number. You do not need your social security number and card to begin working, but you will have to show it to your human resources uh, to fill out those employer documents like the I-9 form. And the I-9 is required for all new employees on campus. So this would only be required for your first on-campus job. And then it would have already been filed for any future jobs you may take. A little note, we have had a lot of SSN letter requests in ISS. We are doing our best to catch up. Um, but it is taking us, you know, I would say a couple weeks just to get through them all. Over 100, for example. All right. So a few notes about J-1 on-campus employment requirements. So you do have to get permission from your sponsor if you're on that J-1 visa. So check your DS 2019 to see who your sponsor is. If it's UW-Madison, then you can complete the J-1 on-campus employment application through Teradata. For non-UW-sponsored students, for example, if you're on Fulbright, Contact your program sponsor for more information about on-campus work requirements. And the duration of your work permission, so J-1s, you need to renew it like every 12 months, or depending on the length of your program, if your program's only for 
10 months, then that is how long you would be granted work permission. Employment authorization letter, you will show that employment authorization letter you receive to your on-campus employer, and you will need to bring it with you when you apply for a social security number. All right, wonderful. So jumping into some of the F1 off-campus employment options, we'll start with CPT. So what is CPT? It stands for Curricular Practical Training, and it's temporary employment authorization, but offers an opportunity to gain practical work experience while you're still enrolled in classes. So a couple pieces that CPT must hit, it must be related to your field of study. It can be paid or unpaid, you get those choices. And it's only available before you complete your program requirements. So CPT is not available to you after you graduate. The purpose of CPT is to apply the knowledge and skills you're doing gaining in the classroom at the same time you're doing that practical work experience. So that's why every semester you are on CPT, you also have to be enrolled in a class to show that balance. All right, and for people who are interested in applying for CPT, there are two options. The first option is it's a requirement of your program. This would be one that every student must complete practical training to earn the degree. Maybe there's an internship that's a required piece of graduation or a co-op required of graduation. Um, to prove that you are required to participate in CPT for graduation, you would need to show additional documentation from the guide, right, the guide of your major, um, and you would have to have that evidence. The other option and type of CPT, which is honestly more popular, I found, is the optional or it's an elective part of your program. So course enrollment and of course design for workplace experience is required. This can change based on major, so it has to check with your academic advisor to see what class is most appropriate. Typically, though, these classes are one to three credits. All right, and so just some basic requirements of CPT. So in order to apply to ISS through Teradata for curricular practical training, you must already have an employment or internship offer with a start date in the future. You must report an employment location, which is the physical address where work will be performed. This address must be in the United States. And a change in employment address will require a new CPT. So if you are working for the um, UW Credit Union branch that is on State Street, and then they change you to, I'm making this up, the UW Credit Union branch, which is on Regent Street, you would need to get a new CPT because ISS would need to update that address. And then determine the number of hours per week that you are working on CPT. So if it is 20 hours or less each week, that is considered part-time. If it is 20 hour, 21 hours a week or more, that is considered full-time. And those details should be listed in that employment offer letter, so pretty easy to tell if it's part-time or full-time. You also have to have specific start and end dates of employment. So ISS grants CPT on a semester basis, because that's how we enroll for classes. Um, and the dates usually coincide with the semester start and end dates. However, I know sometimes CPT internships will go for longer than that. Just remember, you would have to reapply every semester you want to participate. And of course, a position description. Because CPT must relate to your major, you need a position description to explain how exactly it does relate to your major. All right, so the application process. Um, get approval from your academic, faculty, or career advisor, and I list all three because it could be different depending on what major you're in as to who you need approval from. You would need to enroll in the appropriate course 
for this semester that you want to participate in CPT, ISS will check. So make sure you do not skip the step. And then you submit the completed curricular practical training application in Teradata. Make sure you're selecting in Teradata the correct semester that you want to participate in. Um, and just follow all of the directions in Teradata. It's going to tell you what documents you need to upload, how to request that verification or approval through Teradata. And of course, a whole detailed application process is also online. Um, so CPT can occur during the summer. You would need to enroll in a summer class, right? Because you have to enroll in a class every semester you participate in CPT. And you would also not be able to be graduated. So a number of students like to participate in CPT between their third and their fourth year if they're an undergraduate student. They are enrolling in classes for spring semester and for the future fall semester, and they have this great opportunity to do an internship over the summer. That's very, very common. All right, next slide. Wonderful, and then those are the whole detailed steps of the CPT application in Teradata. So you find it by going to that new or the current F1 students tab, click right because we are still accepting applications for students who are participating in CPT for fall semester, you know, if they were starting position in October. So if you're planning ahead and after the career conference have this op some opportunity to work for spring, make sure you're selecting spring. You know, submit all of those documents, request the electronic verification, and make sure to hit submit. And then an ISS advisor will review it. Okay, next slide. Perfect. And you know that ISS, we want to get things done as soon as possible, but we have a lot of requests that come in. So do plan up to 15 business days that it will take to process your request. You cannot begin CPT until you see that ISS has granted CPT on page two of your I-20. And that little picture on the slide is what a CPT authorization looks like, if you all are curious. All right, so a couple notes about CPT. Part-time CPT does not affect your ability to apply for optional practical training or OPT. Full-time CPT could impact your opportunity to apply for OPT if you have worked full-time CPT or been authorized for full-time CPT for 365 days or more. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry, y'all. I don't know when I got muted. Um, so CPT can be authorized multiple times, uh, contingent upon departmental requirements. And then of course, CPT cannot be used to delay graduation. Graduation is all based on your classes. All right, next slide. All right, so we'll spend the last few minutes talking about OPT. Optional practical training is employment authorization that offers an opportunity to gain practical work experience. So again, related to your field of study, it can be paid or unpaid, and it's available before or after you complete your program requirements, which we will touch on briefly. OPT requires adjudication through USCIS, US Citizenship and Immigration Services, this is not something that only ISS can approve. And of course, the purpose of OPT is for students to apply the knowledge and skills they've already gained in the classroom and then to go and use it for practical work experiences. So OPT, you are not required to enroll in a class while participating in OPT. So three types, pre-completion OPT, which is frankly the least common, students usually choose to do CPT. Post-completion OPT, which is practical training authorized to start after completion of study, after that I-20 end date. And the STEM extension OPT, this is twice in a lifetime, 24 month extension. 
post-completion OPT is 12 months. So STEM extension would add an additional 24 months to that time. And it's available to STEM majors in very specific degree programs. All right, so who can apply for OPT? Very similar to all of the other work authorization we've talked about. You have to be enrolled full-time for one academic year. That's one fall and one spring semester with that active I-20 and F-1 visa. You are maintaining valid F-1 status, so you're enrolling full-time. You are physically present in the United States and you intend to pursue a practical training or employment directly related to your major, your field of study. You have not been authorized for the 365 days of full-time CPT, and you have not been authorized for 12 months of OPT at the same or higher degree level. So if you already have a bachelor's degree and you've already participated in OPT at a bachelor's level, you cannot reapply for OPT at a bachelor's level, even if you get a second bachelor's degree. No job offer is required to do OPT. All right, so the application process, three easy steps. Step one, sorry, Amy, you're gonna have to click a couple times. So complete the OPT workshop through Teradata and submit your OPT request to ISS. Keep in mind, it takes about 15 business days for ISS to complete your request and give you that OPT recommended. Step two would be you complete the USCIS form I-765. This is like the application form for OPT. And step three is you submit all the required documents to USCIS, the form I-765, the OPT I-20, many other documents that are listed in the OPT workshop, and you have a choice. You can file through mail or electronic. You get to choose. Keep in mind, once you submit your OPT request to USCIS, on average, it takes three to five months for USCIS to process and get back to you. Something very unique this semester is that students who apply their OPT application to USCIS before October 31st of this year can apply for OPT up to 120 days before the program end date listed on their I-20. The normal timeline is you cannot apply more than 90 days. USCIS has extended that application period for this semester only. All right. And once you get approved for OPT, you get excited, you find a job, maybe you move to Silicon Valley, it's beautiful. You do have to continue to report to ISS just so we can report to USCIS about what work you are doing. So if you change your US residential address, you need to let ISS know. If you have a change in your permanent foreign address, let us know. Update of employment status. Maybe you do not have a job when OPT starts, but in one week you are able to get a job and you wanna let ISS know, hey, I'm employed. And of course, if there's a change to your legal name in your passport, let ISS know. Keep proof of employment for your records, pay stubs, employment offer letters, everything. It's great to have those handy in case you need them in the future. Once your OPT starts, you get an EAD card that has a start date and an end date. You cannot get more than 90 days of unemployment during that entire 12 month period of OPT, which is why it's super important to tell ISS when you do have a job. Otherwise that 90 days keeps adding up because we didn't know you got a job. All right. And then one quick note about acceptable employment on OPT, you get a few options. So as long as it's directly related to your major field of study, right, that's printed on the I-20, you can do an internship while on OPT, you can do a volunteer opportunity, you can be a contracted specialist, maybe that's working with a few other places, you can even do staffing or temporary agencies, as long as it's related to your major. You must work over 20 hours a week 
So if you need a couple of those jobs combined to hit that 20 hours a week, perfect. Thanks. So, and then the last little note, because I talked about that 24 month extension if for students who have a STEM major. So you can check to see if you are STEM eligible by using that link and going onto that USCIS page. It has what are called SIP codes, which is a six digit number next to your major on your I-20. And to qualify for that extension, you have to first be on OPT. So you would have had to apply and get approved for post-completion OPT first. Your work while on STEM extension is a little different. So you do have to be employed full time in a position related to your STEM degree and your employer must be e-verified. And processing times are similar to OPT. So you reapply to USCIS to get that STEM extension, which means you also have to go to ISS first, get an updated I-20, then fill out the I-765, then apply to USCIS, so plan ahead. This is not something you can get done within a day. There's a whole webpage dedicated to STEM eligibility application process, so check out our website for more details. And of course, make an advising appointment or come to drop-ins if you're curious and want more details. All right, so here's contact information for both of our wonderful offices. So Molly at SuccessWorks on State Street, right above the bookstore, super great convenient location. And International Student Services, we are in the historic Red Gym, second floor, and my contact details are there. And with that, I think we have some time for questions. There were a few questions in the chat that we haven't responded to yet. So I don't know if we want to start with those first and then people can add more. So I think starting with Hakan's question, um, I can answer that one. And then as they come in, if anyone else wants to jump in. Um, my name is Melissa. I also work in ISS as an advisor and interim assistant director. Um, so I might be helping with advising if you have questions as well. Um, so the difference he asked, or they asked about the difference between CBT and pre-completion OPT, which is a good question because both of them could happen before you graduate. Um, the main difference is that CPT um, needs to be connected to a curricular component, so your coursework, um, which usually means a class or a degree requirement. Um, CBT is also usually faster to approve because um, we, can approve, we can process that in our office and it only takes a few weeks. OPT, just like post-completion OPT, pre-completion OPT, you must apply to the U.S. government before you can, and get approval before you can start, and that can take several months. So I, I think that's many students, most students, I would say, use OPT unless there's kind of a special circumstance where maybe pre-completion OPT makes more sense in their situation. But if you're thinking about doing an internship, a practicum, a co-op, anything like that before you graduate, CPT is probably your best option to have that experience. Um, and if you read the website and you look at all the information and you have more questions, definitely visit ISS Drop-In Advising and then you can talk with an advisor like one-on-one -on -one about your situation. So hopefully that explains it. It's mostly the processing time um, that makes a big difference and one has to be connected to a class and one doesn't. If there are other questions, I think that the raise hand feature is available as well. And we could unmute a, an individual participant to ask your question. So if you have another question, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and we can recognize you. Great, I'm gonna recognize Shiloh and ask her to unmute for a moment. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, so I have a question because we were like, uh, we were just told like we don't need any job job offer to apply for OPT, but it it also says like 
We cannot accrue more than 90 days of unemployment during the OPT time. So does that mean it's better if we had like have got a job offer before we apply for OPT? Yeah, that would be my question. I can answer that one um, quickly. So you don't have to have a job offer to apply for OPT, but once your OPT is approved and starts, you do have to be trying to work, um, finding a job or working. But because it can take three to five months to process the OPT applications, you might not have a job when you apply, but then you should use that time while the application is processing to find a job for OPT. Um, so that's why it's not required when you apply, but of course you don't want to use use up all of your unemployment days. So once you've applied, you should use that time so that you have a job once your OBT starts in a few months. Hopefully that makes sense. Thanks, Melissa. I'm gonna ask Nick to unmute. I see their hand up too. Yeah, thank you, Amy. So yeah, I'd like to provide more detail about the previous question I asked. So the reason why I asked uh, uh, the two, question later is that I found this question on the um, handshake website. So especially because they are required for me to answer whether I am authorized to work in the US and uh, if I will now or in the future require visa sponsorship. Right now I'm a F1 student and uh, I'm a junior psych major. I can answer that as well. Um, and if other people have answers, feel free to jump in. Um, if they ask you if you now or in the future require sponsorship, the answer is yes, because in the future at some point you will require sponsorship because your F-1 visa can't last forever. So once you've used up the permissions allowable connected to your F-1 visa, like OPT or CPT, um, after that you would require sponsorship. So in that case, the answer would be yes. Um, in the future, you do require sponsorship, unfortunately. Yeah, thank you. So how about the one that am I authorized to work in the U.S.? And I can pop in. So if it's a, are you currently authorized to work in the U.S.? And let's say you're an active F1 student and you've been maintaining status, then yes, you are currently authorized to work in the U.S., because you would get authorization through UW-Madison. Okay, thank you. So final one is that because on the student job website, I found there are some jobs categorized as a local student job. So I'm not sure if international student can apply for that. Molly, I'm less familiar with local student jobs. Do you know maybe what that category is? It doesn't sound like it's on-campus job. Is it like Madison internships or jobs in the local area? Uh, it's like a on-campus job, I guess. Yeah, and there are one category is uh, a not on-campus job, but uh, like general. This a uh, student job website on of uh, uh, yeah, and there are some job categorizes uh, uh, local student job, and this one I found is in medicine, like mostly are in medicine. Yeah, I am not familiar with that terminology. Um, I may, maybe I'll, I'll do some more research into that. And if you want to message me your email address, just send me a direct message and I can, I can do some digging there and hopefully get back to you. Okay, thank you. And I think the important thing there is if it's on campus employment, Amy just shared the link for that. So the work is happening on campus and you're usually being paid by the university, then you don't need extra permission, you can apply for that. The only exceptions might be if a job is listed as work study, um, then you have to be a US citizen, citizen or permanent resident to use work study. Um, but any other jobs as international students on campus, you should be able to apply for. 
If the employer is not the university or the work is happening off campus, even if it's in Madison, then you would need CPT um, and have it connected to your coursework to be able to, to have that experience. But if it's on campus, um, usually it's okay. If you're not sure, you can always send an information request with the specific job to your ISS advisor and we can double check it for you. Okay, I see a couple more hands. So, Prine, let's go with you first, and then we'll move to Sandra. So, uh, if if I'm graduating in May 2022, so when is the good time to apply for an OPD? Here, I can pop in. So, uh, you know, you can plan ahead. The ISS website has this really wonderful OPT date calculator on our site if you want to play with your dates a little bit. So let's say your I-20 end date is listed as May 31st, but you want to get it a little bit closer to graduation so you could start work faster. Um, so you shorten your I-20 to May 15th. Then thinking about 90 days before May 15th would be the earliest you could submit your application to USCIS, right? And so that's probably going to be somewhere in early to mid-March. With that, you could even start the OPT workshop through Teradata before that time, right? Give yourself a week to go through the helpful videos on that workshop collect the documents that you're going to need to apply to ISS to get that new I-20. And then, of course, it takes us some time. Um, we're not robots, so it takes us about three weeks to get a new OPT I-20 to you, which you would then need for your application. So you can start as early as February. However, you are able to apply for OPT through that 60-day grace period after your graduation date. So it also depends on when you want to start working, because you have to be approved for OPT before you can start working. Great, and we have just one more question and then we'll wrap up. Sandra, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? I have joined in the medium of this recording, so I'm not sure if you talk about CPT time limitation, that. Um, this is the question one. And question two is, um, once we have used our CPT on campus, um, does it influence the usage of OPT later? So I can answer that one. So as far as time limitations, it, there is a limitation for full-time CPT. So there's two different types of CPT, full-time and part-time. And you tell us which type of CPT you'll be using when you apply. Full-time is 20 hours a week or more, and part-time is 20 hours a week or less. So basically, if it's more than 20 hours, it's considered full-time. Um, and so there is a limit to the number of full, the amount of full-time CPT you can use if you want to apply for OPT after you graduate. So if you are hoping to use OPT, post-completion OPT, then you should not use more than 364 days, so less than one year, of full-time CPT. Um, and then, but there is not a limit to part-time CPT. It's just that part-time CPT, um, you'll need authorization each semester that you use it, and it, every, it always needs to be connected to a class or a degree requirement in your program. Um, so you can do more than one CPT, and you can do kind of, as long as you're eligible, as many part-time CPTs as you want keeping in mind that you still need to be enrolled full-time, maintaining your status, and making progress as a student. You can't just stay and do a bunch of CBTs, um, but you can do more than one during your course of time as a student. 
So hopefully that kind of explains that situation. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, we got a, We got an okay in the chat. Great. Great. Well, I think that's just about all the time that we have for today. So let's go ahead and wrap it up. Yeah. So if you have any further question about work authorization, please check the ISS website or come to drop in advising. And if you have questions and concerns about career or job hunting tips, please go to the SuccessWorks website and also make appointment with your career center for your major, your school and colleges. So thank you so much, Molly and Kathleen for presenting and Amy and Melissa for answering the questions. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Please come back to other Success Friday sessions. We will be having every Friday from 11 to noon. Um, next Friday is a session focused on volunteer and leadership opportunities. So we hope to see you again. And with this, I will end this meeting. Thank you. Have a great weekend.